Hi, I'm Jan Doyle. Welcome to Wise Talk. Today we have two outstanding guests on the show who are marvelous photographers. I'd like to welcome Lisa Chuchara and Mark Bowie. Welcome to the show. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks now, for having us. I'm so thrilled to have both of you. Now, Lisa, I understand coming up there's a conference called NECCC. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. NECCC is the New England Camera Club Council Conference. It's a photography conference that takes place every July. This is our 73rd annual conference, so we've been around for a while. She's good for 73 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a basically a three-day immersion into photography. We have over 65 programs. We have hands-on events. We have pre-conference workshops, photo shoots, photo walkabouts. Um, most people come for the whole weekend, but you could just come just for Saturday and just enjoy the day. Um, very few people just choose for the day, but some people can't manage the whole weekend in there. So it's kind of just this whole immersion into photography. It's something everybody looks forward to as kind of a family reunion with old friends. But then about 30% of our attendees are first timers, so we welcome first time people coming to the conference. Yeah, as I've well. gone for many, many years, and you're absolutely right. You see people, perhaps you only see once a year, yeah. or people who have moved away and they come to the conference. It's really a wonderful time. You leave it, you leave very happily exhausted. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> what you do. So uh, on today's uh, show, we have one of the speakers at the conference, Mark Bowie. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're going to be teaching there? Yes, indeed. I uh, am responsible for two presentations, one called Envision, the Art of Seeing Creatively, and a second one on shooting multiple exposures for maximum landscapes. And I'm also doing one of the pre-conference workshops that Lisa had, men had mentioned, and it's called uh, Beyond excuse me, it's called Innovative Night Imagery Beyond the Milky Way. Not only shooting the Milky Way, but so many other possibilities of photographing the beautiful night sky. Are you doing one of the walkabouts by any chance? I'm not. This is all indoor with an hour-long presentation followed by two hours worth of hands-on processing techniques. Okay, great. Well, let's start uh, be a little more specific and look at some of your work. The first one you're doing, the first workshop, is what again? The Envision, the Art of Seeing Creatively workshop. And what does that mean exactly? Well, it's a really a, it's a one-hour presentation geared to teaching photographers how to go deeper, how to create images that are beyond the commonplace, to create something that's truly special and heartfelt. So um, I introduce a lot of tips and strategies and techniques for looking beyond the commonplace to find the subtle nuances that can create some really beautiful imagery. Were you ever a classroom teacher? <laughs> the reason, no, I was a former <laughs> geologist, but a well, nature photographer. Well, because you use the word go deeper, and that, as I'm a retired teacher, and that was a term we would use, and you mentioned it to me when we had chatted before, and it just occurred to me to ask you about it. So I was just wondering if you were a teacher It's ever. so funny you bring it up, because <laughs> it's really become quite a catchphrase for me. Every time I mention the, the phrase go deeper, photographers will come back to me and they say, I was in the field, I pressed myself to go every deeper, and sure enough, I came out with beautiful images that I had no preconception of what I was going to be finding. Oh, that's So it's really heartwarming. That really so is I, interesting. So I keep mentioning it. I mean, it, it starts to make sense to people, and if that's what it takes to get through and to create special images, that's a great way to think about yes, it. Yes, that's a great catchphrase. So let's look at your first one, Beach Forest. Now, I don't want to the image that's going to come up on the monitor. I don't want people to know this, but what did I say to you in the... <laughs> uh, this, and Lisa doesn't know this. This, this came up in the uh, director's room, and I said to Mark, that doesn't look like a beach. <laughs> and, and you said to me... I'm assuming you were thinking this was a birch forest. Yeah. But no, these are truly beach le the beach leaves. Okay. Who, I, I knew that. I was a teacher. So, um, and this is, where is this taking shot? This was taken in Pittsfield State Forest in the Berkshires, um, which is my hometown. And um, it's actually a great example of going deeper. When I originally shot this as a straight-on scene, that is, with no fancy other techniques involved. It was just a straight, sh straight shot, shot at F-16 with everything tack sharp front to back. Mm -hmm. There's a number of things I really like about it. This, this beautiful golden forest leads your eye back through the little gap there to the darker shadow areas in the back. And there's a beautiful color contrast between the cool blues of the back and then the beach forest. But when I shot that as a straight shot, it didn't give me the, the feeling looking at that as I felt as I was standing there. I felt like I was encased in this beautiful, luminous, glowing light. So I asked myself, how am I going to go deeper? I decided that rather than shooting just a straight single shot, I would shoot this as a double exposure in camera. 
That is, the first shot was taken at f16 in intact sharp focus. The second one, right on top of that, was shot at a wide open aperture, f2.8, and then intentionally defocused outwards so that the leaves now have this glowing aura around it, which um, allowed me to present the image in the, the, the manner in, wealth, in which I felt that place, this beautiful, luminous, glowing forest. Oh, that is interesting. I, I think that shoot, what it feels like, is something that you do have to evolve as a photographer into that, rather than just shooting documentary. Most of us aren't PJ and documentary, so that shoot, what it feels like, becomes something that your pictures have more meaning to you and to the people who view them. Yeah, That's... I think you're absolutely right. And my question to you is, one thing I really struggle with sometimes is when I go out and shoot by myself, I find it's it's sometimes it's better for me than to shoot with like on a camera club field trip. Hmm. And do you find that per, your personal work comes through more? You know, I was kind of the exact opposite. I used to go out as a solo photographer because that's why I did that. I wanted to go out and experience nature on my own and kind of have the joy of discovery of seeing and shooting places like I felt like I was the very first person to ever come come upon that scene. Never been memorialized in a song or a poem. But now I find that if I go out shooting with other people, we're constantly bouncing creative ideas off of one another. Mm -hmm. And it helps both of us, especially for night photography, which I know we'll get to talk yes, about shortly. Yes, yes. Oh, that's interesting. Now, we have another image, fall foliage, that's going to come up on the monitor. And where was this taken? This was taken in the central Adirondacks at Long Lake. There's fog coming off a nearby pond and wafting through that beautiful fall foliage. Um, shooting foliage that is so busy like this, it gets so congested that it's very difficult to come up with, a, with an interesting composition that doesn't kind of make the eye go crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, the fog really helped. It softens and simplifies the compositions. It declutters the forest. So now all these beautiful curving lines and all those beautiful subtle fall foliage tones start coming out. Are you an early morning photographer? I love to be out early. Even if I don't find anything to photograph, I love the feeling of just being out there on my own letting the rest of the world sleep if they want. And it's, what time are we talking? <laughs> oh, I'm up early, well before the sun. In fact, I, I, the goal is to be on site at least an hour before the sun rises, ready to start shooting. Because I'm oftentimes finding that the most beautiful light is exactly then. And then the fall, color, the fall colors, all the colors will start getting a little bit muted until the sun actually hits the horizon again, then you get the beautiful light. But if I want to be on site for two beautiful surges of light, that means getting up pretty early. Mm, that's I, I can actually true. remember a, a presentation that Mark did a few years ago at NECCC, and it was when night photography was really mm -hmm. becoming popular because of digital photography and easier for because of the technology. Right. And I remember thinking, well, before we could sleep a few hours at night, and now we have this <laughs> multiple exposure where we can do things during the day when it used to be contrasty. So we used to be able to sleep like maybe between 10 and 2. And, kind of get a little, <laughs> and I remember coming away from that conversation. It's like, there's no more time to sleep. <laughs> we, can time to sleep. sleep. You know, we can photograph 24 hours a day now. I think you do also. <laughs> so you know? right. That is so interesting. Now, another, um, another class you're teaching is on multiple exposures. Yes, it's called uh, Multiple Exposures for Maximum Landscapes. The idea is to present new strategies and tips and techniques on shooting multiple exposures of the exact same scene to accomplish images that aren't just possible with a single straight exposure. You're going to be busy that weekend. Yeah, it's going to be, so be how great. Many, how many times are you um, presenting the first workshop? That gets presented once. And this workshop? And the multiple get, exposures gets done twice. And then your third presentation? Is that pre-conference workshop. It's a three hour long segment right, on right. shooting and processing night images. Oh, you're going to have a bu busy weekend. It's going to be great. So let's look at some of the pictures for the multiple exposures. The first one is at a fall shop. Of falls and and the name of the falls are yeah, this is Sahali Falls in central Oregon up in the mountains uh, it is an example of a multiple exposure in that this is slightly cropped a panorama of four overlapping images panning from the right over to the left again something that's quite not the same if you try to shoot this with a single exposure using a wide angle lens you know with the wide angle lens everything else seems to diminish off into the background by shooting this as a multiple exposure with a longer lens, I'm keeping the stature of the subject and still being able to capture the wide view. So you shoot the whole image four times, but with a different focus, or do you shoot parts of the image? Uh, I'll do those for different types of shots. This one was done with four overlapping images, each overlapped by about a third. Okay. So it's four individual shots that have been now stitched together in Photoshop. 
Okay, because I learned a word from Lisa, and is this an? Ex I'm not sure if it applies here or not. Is this stacking or not? Okay, I guess I didn't really <laughs> learn it, Lisa. <laughs> it's similar in nature to it, but yeah. but this but is rather stitching. Than this, this is stitching, mm -hmm. and that's different than stacking. Correct. <laughs> okay, I have a long way to go. I just gonna have to write this down and look it up. All right, the next one is called Albany Flowers. Yeah, this was shot in Empire State Plaza in downtown Albany, New York. Um, one of the issues of shooting directly into the sun, as I've done here, which is taken right at sunset, is that the exposure range is so great that the camera sensor literally doesn't have the ability to capture all those subtle tones and colors in one straight exposure. So in this case, I had to shoot four exposures, one stop apart, and then stitch those together, or blend them, in Lightroom as an HDR, a high dynamic range image. Mm -hmm. So now everything is properly exposed, right? From the foreground flowers out to the blue sky in the back. Can you talk a little bit more about HDR or high dynamic range? Yeah, we, we shoot this as a necessity to be able to capture all the beautiful tones and colors within an image. And I'm finding that I oftentimes like to use it as I'm shooting directly at or at least towards the sun because there's such a great range of beautiful light and color. I don't want to be constrained to having to shoot a single straight exposure in which maybe only have the sky properly exposed or if I properly expose the foreground then the sky blows out. I want to be able to capture that whole wide range of light. So I'm shooting a series of exposures with the camera on the tripod in this case. Um, the exact same composition, I'm simply changing the shutter speed or the ISO by one stop each time. So shooting from a lighter exposure to a dark exposure and then taking in this case those four images then blending them in Lightroom to accomplish that one single shot. Alright, so is this a new word blending as opposed to stitching and, uh, and uh, stacking? <laughs> I suppose. Okay, I'm taking notes on this. I got three things to look up. Do, do you concur with what blending? I, I do. I love doing blending. A majority of my pictures I do are blended pictures now. And so, I think the viewers mm -hmm. probably have taken a picture where they looked at a beautiful sky with nice clouds and they take the picture and they go, ooh, the clouds don't look very good because the right. camera has to kind of make a decision of what to expose properly. So the blending gives you really a lot whatever your eye sees. Okay, going to the cloud idea that you just had. So taking the picture and then taking the clouds. So instead of replacing the clouds, you're blending. Correct. This might solve my Photoshop issues that I have. <laughs> you're cured. I, I was telling him I, I have a lot of Photoshop issues. So, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to look this one up. Okay, so the next one we have is uh, Brandon Beach. Uh, this is Banded Beach Banded on the Beach. southern Excuse Oregon me. coast. Uh, you're looking at Face Rock off in the distance, and maybe you can see a little crescent moon popping off just to its left. This is a two-shot panorama. You know, we don't have to be constrained by the, the little 2 by 3 or 35 millimeter dimensions of our typical shots. Oftentimes, I'm shooting a panorama to be able to include lots of interesting subject matter on either side of a single shot. This is just barely wider than a single shot. But I'm also using the same compositional tools that I use for regular shooting. I mean, look at the beautiful diagonals that take your eye from the beach all the way out to the stacks in mm. the back. Uh, the contrast between the richly, almost silhouetted rocks and the pastel tones in the background. Uh, and the use of a wide-angle lens up close and personal to those beautiful forms right along the shoreline, um, emphasized with the wide-angle lens. Mm -hmm. Those eye particularly, your eye... Your eye just keeps on going. It just—it doesn't stop. It just—it starts and then it just keeps on going back. Yeah, and I call this purposeful composition. When you arrive on site, I think it behooves you, if you're going to make truly special images, to not only capture beautiful light, but really think about how you're going to compose this to help lead the viewer's eye through the scene. Mm, good point. Very good point. Now, um, you're going to be talking about... Um, you're going, and I understand some techniques like panorama, uh, time lapse, focus stacking, or not. Am yeah, I'll correct? get to focus stacking as well as HDRs, panoramas, and layer masking. Layer masking is. Oh, God, here's kind of another word I got to write down. <laughs> <laughs> layer, layer masking, okay, fine. That's fun. why you come to a conference like this. You that's come to right. be inspired, and then you want to learn more, and then to learn techniques, and then to bring those home and implement them. That's exactly what you You are you go. so good. You are so right, too. <laughs> yeah, you are so good because I feel so Photoshop challenged. I've, ta I've taken hundreds of classes. I took a class with Lisa, and with, this, is, it, this is so true. This better be good. It was a couple of years ago, and she was very, very good. She had all 
the people who were accomplished who could st stay with her mm -hmm. up front and center. And all the people who, all there were aides walking around who would help you on an individual basis were towards the back. <laughs> Guess where I was sitting? I was in the last <laughs> row and I almost had a one-on-one -on -one help. And I still had issues. Yeah, but I heard the light bulb go off a few times. Yes, it did. <laughs> it did. It did. And I know, I know um, Photoshop is the way to go. Lightroom so, and Photoshop. At $10 mm -hmm. a month through Adobe is absolute terrific value these yes, days. Yes, that's what I heard. Now, Lisa, out of all these techniques, is there one that you love above all, like between stitching, blending, stacking, HDR? It, that's tough. It's like asking somebody what their favorite photograph is. It's what I'm doing right now. Like, you know, my favorite picture is what I'm going to take next. I mean, mm -hmm. I love all of these techniques. It's like I said, but why sleep anymore? Because you can do all, all right. of these different things at different times of the day. They just allow you to kind of, again, shoot what it feels like. So you have to kind of know just like what lens to pick up or what technique to pick up, what's going to display what's in your heart and what you see to, to that image that you finally create. Well, that's a nice distinction, and that's an excellent distinction. You have to know the technique so you know what you, which one you want to choose and pick from. And although I have to tell you, I could tell you which is one of my favorite photographs that you have taken. <laughs> I can tell My you. My kitty cat, I yes. do know. Really? Yes. She, she took it 800, she took it 800 years ago. It's a picture of, um, it's in Tom's hand. He was a baby and Sopho Socrates. Socrates. Oh, yes. And what a, oh, every time I think. She I, remembered it 10 years later. I'm really impressed that's with That's a special image, right? I love that. I, could, I mean, she's taken a couple in between then. But, uh, but I, I can tell you my favorite photograph. Now, Mark, I understand you're an accomplished author, and I have your books on the set, and you won, I'm just reading this because I want to make sure I get it right, you have three books that won the Adirondack Center, Adirondack Center for Writing Photography book. Tell me, tell me a little bit about yes, that. Yes, indeed. Um, the Adirondack Waters book was the first one I did. That was followed up by a historical reference book called In Stoddard's Footsteps, where I went and I literally photographed in the exact same areas that Seneca Ray Stoddard did back in the late 1800s. Now, why, why is that so significant? Well, I wanted to see the, really the differences good or bad, between what he saw 100, 125 years ago to now. And oftentimes I was really pleasantly surprised that the landscape does indeed look better these days than back in his time. Oftentimes they had to clear cut the forest to be able to use the wood to build the villages. And uh, he was shooting <laughs> a bunch of houses in a quaint little village, but there's totally denuded forest around him. Mm -hmm. Now I, sometimes I went back to those exact same locations and um, now I couldn't see the village because I'm shooting through 100-year-old trees that are this high. That is so it's interesting. So very impressive. I, I think my thought would be that it would be worse. I don't know what you would think, Lisa, but... Yeah, I think that's the first thing that comes to people when sure. you think about that. That's yeah. how the media and we've been kind of led to portray. So it's nice to be able to see the images and see what we've been able to... How, how things have changed over time. Yeah, it's really neat. The book is kind of like a little puzzle book. You know, you see the, the differences between the two, differences in in how we live and how we work there, how differences in fashion and how we recreate and all kinds of different things. So it's a great puzzle book. The third book is on Adirondack seasons. Um, they indeed, uh, each won the Adirondack Photography Center's uh, Book of the Year Award. So um, I'm as enamored with the writing as I am with the photography. And oftentimes I'll carry a dictaphone out in the field with me so that I can relate immediately what I'm seeing and sensing so I can get this down in print later on. It's very, very helpful. Oh, that's very interesting. One of my favorite pictures that uh, Mark did at a presentation was pretty much like having the tripod in the same place, but at four different seasons. And you oh, blended right, the right. images one into the right. other, and it was just fascinating to see how it changes. I mean, the years and the seasons go by so fast, but to see it in you know one frame and the way that you right. composed it yes, and watched the yes. fall and you know spring come and summer, it was it was amazing. Yes. Now, did you meet him at the Adirondack Center? Because I know you were going up there all the time. Boy. I was wondering oh. where you met him. It's been a number of years, maybe <laughs> out in the field or in a workshop. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Jeez, I. Okay, so I, I, mean, I, I was just. Remember, sorry. I just. That's okay. I, <laughs> I, don't I, I, work. I don't remember exactly where we. Okay, where we all right. Just yeah. asking, just saying. <laughs> now, when I. Um, Notice also on the set you have some CDs. What are these CDs about? Yeah, I do instructional work on how to shoot at night and how to process the images. So I've couple, come up with a couple instructional DVDs. And the third one you may be seeing is about my Finding November project, where it's been three years ago now. I gave myself kind of a self-assigned project. Is that like Finding Nemo? 
<laughs> on a creative basis, yeah. I suppose so, so finding November. It might have been harder to find November. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm sorry. So explain to me that finding. Yeah, November. it was really a. It was really a self-assigned project to make myself go out and see if I could find November's hidden beauty, right? It's kind of like at the year's twilight. Most of the leaves are off the trees by then. So what, I was, what was I going to do to be able to get creative and go out and find the beauty that we're all passing by? So I shot almost every single day of the month. I went out in pre-dawn darkness, sunrise, sunset, twilight, and at night. Every single time I went out, I found something worthy to shoot. Um, Certainly not every image is a calendar image, but I think if you take it, the collection as a whole, it really reveals the spirit of the November landscape, its look and its feel. Uh, I was so enamored with the project, I went ahead and made this kind of instructional DVD for it. I think that's interesting, um, first of all, th about the project, but I also think it's interesting you gave yourself a self-assignment and a challenge, a self-assignment or a challenge. Now, have you done other things? Have you, do you challenge yourself that way or not? I do. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk about that in the Art of Seeing program in that I think one of the best things uh, even amateur photographers can do is give themselves a project to go photograph something they really love because they're going to go deeper and they're going to go beyond anybody that's just treating the subject on the surface is going to be able to do. So I always have at least one project or going cooking all the time. I know yeah, you do so too. I'm gonna does it in my head at all times. Really? So, yeah. Exactly, Lisa. What are they? Right. <laughs> Let me write them down, all right? So I can I can go up and be just like you, Lisa. That's what I'm hoping. But it helps you to become a better photographer by kind of having that project that you're doing, and it helps to challenge yourself. I mean, some photographers believe in competition, and that's a fine venue. Mm. But you're your best competitor. How can you challenge yourself to become a better photographer? Yes. Yes. And and I know in camera clubs, so I know the New Haven Camera Club, uh, we did a talk here on the New Haven Club, you weren't involved in that one, but they have assigned subjects every year, yeah. and I think other camera clubs must do that. Mm -hmm. And what, the purpose of the assigned subjects is one is to go out and challenge yourself to take those pictures, Correct. as opposed to going your archives and right, pulling them right. out. Yep. Which I sort of yeah. just had If you're a nature photographer and the assigned subject is abandoned houses and you've never done that before, mm -hmm. you have to think about how to get a good picture of that. Or if you're not a people photographer, how do you get a good picture of a person? So it does. It kind of gets you out of your comfort zone. And you'd be surprised at how that applies to all aspects of your photography. And it, it just increases awareness in everything that you just yep. said. Mm -hmm. But I also know some people don't like doing that mm -hmm. and choose not to do that particular subject. I do know that happens. Uh, now you have, um, you, could, you go on work, you go on, uh, not field trips, you go on tours? I with, teach photographic workshops through the, Adir yeah, through the Adirondack Photography Institute as well as the Cape Cod Art Center. Uh, so I probably teach 10 or 12 a year. Uh, they range anywhere from four to six days. So they're filled with obviously field shooting and as well as indoor instruction to really stretch the bounds of everybody's horizons. Now uh, we have a picture on that, one of, the, uh, one of the lighthouses that's going to be coming up and what is the name of this lighthouse? I believe you're referring to the Nauset Lights, yep. Now this is just beautiful. Which is near Easton on Cape Cod. So I teach um, several workshops on night photography. Uh, this was devoted to actually photographing throughout the day and into the night. So very little sleep for this one. Um, I love this shot. Uh, every time I go to this lighthouse, it's absolutely magical. It's always different. In this, obviously, we're, we have a pretty decent little fog going. But at the same time, you can start to see some of the stars peeking through in the background. Mm -hmm. Is this a one-shot deal? This or? is a single shot, yes. Although, yeah. Because I don't trust you now. <laughs> <laughs> you learn quickly that shooting lighthouses is pretty tricky business. So I've learned here at NASA to actually count how long it takes the beam to rotate all the way around. And I try to shoot exposure shorter than that, so I capture the beam in a particular position rather than having a really lengthy exposure wash everything out. And it worked beautifully on the fog. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. All right, and the next one um, on the Milky Way is going to be coming up on the picture? This was actually taken in the central Adirondacks at a, a campground called Lower, Lower Brown's Tract Pond. Uh, this is shot at about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, the Milky Way glows like a cloud there. It's so dark. The skies are so rich. Um, you see some other colors in there that are that are not fake. Those are a natural phenomenon called air glow. The, the green and the purplish colors are indeed air glow. And hmm. It's coming from cosmic rays that's striking particles in the upper atmosphere and ionizing them. In particular, um, I see a lot of air glow at the same time, the same nights as the northern lights pop out. And on this particular night, out of scene to the right, the northern lights were indeed seen. 
Well, I think it's amazing. Um, and also, I like to stress that as uh, both Lisa and I are both members of the New Haven Camera Club, and if people want to have the opportunity to just enjoy lectures by photographers, they can go check out the video on the New Haven Camera Club, and people can come to that for free. And you've been to New Haven, you said, about two or three times. Yeah, I've spoken there several times. Uh, we did a full-day workshop there one time, mm -hmm. which was great. That was pro prior to my time, I'm just saying. Now you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's do it again. Yeah, that, well, I would like to. And But this here also going to be at NECCC. And Lisa, could you give the um, website for that if people want yes. to attend that? So www.neccc.org. Okay, great. It's a great time. Yep. And Mark, could you give your contact information, please? Yes, it's Mark Bowie. And the website is markbowie.com. Mm -hmm. And if you forget those that information and you'd like to contact me, it's jmdteach at comcast.net. That is uh, my email address. Or if you forget all of that, the easiest thing might be to contact the studio and they'll put you in touch with me. So I want to thank both of you for coming on the show. I can't wait to go this summer and take some of these workshops. I'm going to go home and look up three or four words and, <laughs> and start studying and taking notes. And I'm so happy that you're on the program. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much.